Um, so my name is Jeff Iron. I run marketing for Mist, and as of a week ago, we have became a Juniper company. I'm here with uh, Osman Sarut, who's our lead cloud engineer. Um, I know you guys don't want to talk to the marketing guy at Field Day, but there's actually two reasons why I'm up here for about three minutes, and then I'm going to get the heck out of the way and let Osman talk to you guys <laughs> about the cloud and what we're doing. You know, reason number one is I have a mission in life, and that's to put Steve's kids through college. I've done storage field day, I've done virtualization field day, I've done mobility field day, and I need to get a cloud field day in under my belt. And so uh, these are great events. We love doing these events. And so when we heard Juniper was doing this and we could be a part of it, we jumped on it. Um, and so we were really excited to be here, number one. Number two, though, is what we want to do is present a little bit of a, a use case and, uh, and understand and explain to you what MIST is doing and why it fits into the Juniper portfolio but also why it's changing AI and IT in general, right? You know, what we like to say is what we're doing is we're leading a, um, a transition to a new era of IT, what we call AI for IT. So really what it's doing is taking that old IT model that is very manual, that's very network centric, that's very reactive, and moving it towards a model that's more proactive, that's more automated, but perhaps most importantly, it's all about the user experience, right? How many times have you guys walked into a room and couldn't get on the Wi-Fi network? and immediately said, the Wi-Fi sucks, right? <laughs> whether it's a hotel, whether it's a conference room, I don't know, maybe like this one, whether it's an, you know, uh, an airport, whatever it is. A lot of the times, it is the Wi-Fi network, uh, and if it is, the IT department needs to know, is it a coverage issue, is it a capacity issue, is it something else? A lot of times, it may be you never got a DHCP address. Maybe the WAN's dropping packets, right? So if you can now bring all that data into the cloud, use machine learning, use neural networks, use other tools, you now have a better experience. And so ultimately, it's about, automating the IT operations, giving a better user experience that's measurable, and then using the cloud for SaaS-based agility, right? Where you can just roll out new features, new software patches overnight where folks show up and it's just there. You don't have to take APs down, you don't have to take controllers down, it's a new model of, of IT that we call AI-driven IT. Um, ultimately, our vision is, while well, we've started focusing on the wireless piece of this, about a year ago we started partnering with Juniper and other vendors to bring in the wired domain, and now that we're one company, we're gonna do that even more. So the whole goal is using that cloud infrastructure using AI is you have one single vision of your user experience. So the minute you walk in this room and get on the wireless network to when you go across the LAN, go across the WAN with all your security portfolios, I want to be able to say this is Jeff's experience. This is the service levels we're offering. This is um, what's maybe happening to him. Predict that maybe this is going in a bad direction and we should reach out to him or fix it on, on our own, ultimately getting to a self-driving network, okay? So when we talk about AI-driven IT, that's what we mean. It's all about automation, insight into the user experience across the full IT stack. And the very last uh, you know, thing I'll, I'll talk about is to do this requires the right cloud architecture. Right? So we got guys like Osman here for the last three years have been building our cloud specifically focused on how you take AI, how you pull in 150 user states from every mobile client every two seconds, how you move it into the cloud and do machine learning, how you do event correlation, how you do anomaly detection, how you do a virtual network assistant on top of that so you can troubleshoot that network. You can't do it without the right cloud. There's other vendors out there that are trying to do it on appliances that are, that are on-prem. That's not the way to do it. And so what he's gonna talk about, how you leverage that cloud for that agility, that scale, that resiliency. Basically the same model that Netflix and LinkedIn and Google are using for their environments, we've taken that to IT, okay? Um, and then again, finally, uh, just to show that it's working, again, in a short period of time, we're seeing amazing success. The top retailer in the world is switching to an AI-driven cloud. The top e-tailer in the world and all their fulfillment and warehouses. The top pharmacy chain in the world. You guys have probably flown through an airport right now where you've walked into the lounge. It's using you know, a missed cloud-driven infrastructure. So again, the world is transitioning to this AI-driven IT, and it all requires the right cloud. So to that, I'm going to pause and bring Osman up, and he'll, he'll let you talk to exactly how he built this cloud infrastructure and how we're going to implement it going forward in the Juniper environment. And, uh, my name is Usman Saroud, and as, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I've been working at uh, MIST for around three years. I'm there, uh, I've, been, I've been leading the cloud and distributed system efforts over there. Before that, I, I did my PhD in high-performance computing from Illinois and worked, uh, led distributed systems at Yelp. So, <clears throat> I'm going to dive right in. Uh, you know, this is what we do at a very high level. 
we have a bunch of access points that sit in the outside world. And before I even start, I'm not a networking guy. I don't know much about how DHCPs and these things work. I've been, I've been uh, doing distributed system for the most part of my life. And that's what I'm going to concentrate over here. So we have, this, we have this bunch of access points lying all over the world, and they send telemetry data back to our cloud. The data enters our SSL terminators, and then it gets pushed onto Kafka. And that's where all the fun starts. From Kafka, we have two different compute engines where we do uh, real-time processing, API serving, and you know a bunch of other things as well, uh, some, uh, some location stuff as well, indoor location. But uh, those are the two main compute engines that, uh, that we use. We do computation in, uh, over there, and then we write the results back to Cassandra, Redis, recently Elasticsearch as well. So uh, as you can see, <clears throat> we're using a lot of open, uh, open source. And uh, one reason we're using a lot of open source is that we wanted to you know, um, be cloud vendor neutral. We didn't want to stick with uh, one, any, uh, Amazon or Google. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a high level of uh, what we do. And uh, just to put some, uh, set some context, we get uh, around two to ten kilobytes, uh, kilo kilobits per second from the access points, and uh, we are running at a at a decent scale, uh, given you know uh, our, our size. Like we're not a Netflix uh, in terms of users and all that, but uh, we we get over ten billion messages. Well, actually, I think this uh, this, I, this number is a bit old. We're probably more than twenty billion messages at at the moment, and yeah. Uh, so Mist, as you know, Jeff lays us. Mist is an AI company which you know which has amazing cloud infrastructure to support AI, and um, one of the flagship projects is, uh, products is the Virtual Network Assistant, and it's it does a bunch of you know uh, Bayesian statistics, probabilistic programming, and it's um, it's powered by two main infrastructure pieces. We we we're still on Apache Storm. And uh, that's where we do some of our real-time processing. And then we have built our own in-house uh, real-time aggregation system, which goes by the name of Live Aggregators. I was presenting about it at Kafka Summit in Strata recently. So that's something you know, uh, we, uh, we're proud of, and we uh, built it ourselves in-house. But you know, the, just to, the, a high-level picture, the data comes in from Kafka. It goes through uh, our aggregation system, gets into uh, Cassandra. Then we have a bunch of uh, a bunch of applications running inside Mesos and some in uh, Storm as well, which consume that data. Do you know things like uh, anomaly detection, Bayesian uh, probability pro probability programming, and that's when you know uh, we also. The VNA Virtual Network Assistant it runs uh, it does a bunch of NLP so you can write what is wrong with my Wi-Fi and it gets translated to you know these queries that you can make across these databases and eventually serve the serve the end customer uh, and like I mentioned we do uh, we are big on anomaly detection and uh, this is something which we have be, been starting to do. Uh, not from the first day at MIST, but recently in the year or so, there's a big push for uh, for anomaly detection. We're doing, you know, uh, it's it's very compute bound. We're doing, you know, seasonal remas, tensor flows, and and yeah. So that much about the product. So now now I'll come to some of the challenges that we faced. You know, when I when I started at MIST around, you know, maybe two and a half years ago, we we almost had well actually. We had probably just one customer, and very little data to say. And when I came in, I was coming in from another company, which was at a much higher scale. And I was like, guys, why do you worry about uh, this infrastructure? You hardly have anything to run. So, but you know, we've grown a lot in the last two years. I've I've been through uh, quarters. We've been we've we've basically doubled. So at 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 present day. We have around 400 terabytes of data, which gets exchanged between different components, like between the Kafka and our uh, random processing engines. And here's, here's, a, here's a picture that I, I like. So this house over here is the AI. And of course, you, know, you, you, you like to build a whole fancy house. You like a cool bedroom and all that. But the cloud infrastructure is the foundations of this house. And that's you know that's 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 the place which you, you know if someone comes to your house you don't show him your foundations you show him your house but it's very the foundations are very important and when the water the data flows in it can all fall down so from the onset we wanted to build an infrastructure just like you know this Jeff over there 
which can withstand huge amount of data. And that is going to be the focus of this talk over here. So, uh, for the remaining part of the talk, what I am going to be talking about is not something that we are selling directly to anyone because no one cares if you are using Kafka, how we, how we are building our uh, aggregation system. It is contributing indirectly in the form that all our, all our AI is built on top of that cloud infrastructure, which in my opinion is extremely vital for any company to do good AI. So, what do what 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 really matters for cloud infrastructure? You know, it's a uh, people talk about reliability, which is an extremely important thing. That's personally my favorite because if you're not reliable in in present day, you know, you, you can't scale and you you'll basically die off pretty soon. Scalability is extremely important, at least for startups like us. Well, now we got acquired by Juniper, and you know, but we'll 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 see. We'll, I'm expecting still to see the same growth pattern. And last but not the least, cost effectiveness. You, you, know, you don't want to spend all your money on building your house's foundation because eventually you know, you'll have to build the house as well. So uh, cost effectiveness is, is, is also something which we have been uh, you know, paid a lot of attention and I'll talk uh, about it in, in, in the coming slides. So uh, we are currently uh, hosted on Amazon. Uh, there are plans on moving on to Google and Azure for uh, for reasons that you know, uh, some of our customers they don't like Amazon, some, you know, so they would want to move to some other cloud. But uh, just to jog your uh, jog your memory, you guys already might be familiar with it. But Amazon offers these three contract types: on-demand, reserved instances, and spot instances. Uh, and you know, they differ in their reliability. They differ in how much money Amazon would charge you for it. Uh, and we are we are using a lot of spot instances, which is highly unreliable, but very, very cost effective. And, um, you know, just to some Re Really quick, you indicated customer preference might be dictating which cloud infrastructure you use. Mm -hmm. So does that mean this, is, is set, this infrastructure is set up per customer? No, absolutely not, absolutely not. So uh, we don't want to go into a world where we set up a small cluster and say, Customer X, you get it. Right. Customer Y, you get it. The whole point, at, you know, that's we had we had a very very we had significant discussions like three years ago that we are not going to do that kind of stuff because it prevents you to, from doing good AI. What I'm referring to uh, over here is we want to have if we want to move to other cloud vendors, a because you know there are a lot of customers who would say you know we don't mind get, being co-hosted with other people but we'd prefer you know a different cloud and also the fact that you know we also want to be resilient and uh, and as you will see in the later slides even in amazon we are doing a bunch of, we are using a bunch of different types of machines and so one other major reason for going moving to another cloud is that we want to have just another cloud for the purpose of you know being being fault tolerant yeah and i may i may also answer a little bit um, uh, more color to that too uh, yeah sorry um, is it on? Okay. Um, so obviously, yeah, Amazon is, is our strategic platform that we're using today. But we also have some customers, for example, one up the road that's a top search engine company that doesn't love using the Amazon cloud, as well as we're very big in retail, and a lot of those folks that don't necessarily want to be on the Amazon cloud. So it's a, it's a, they basically designed this architecture to be portable. So that is one of the reasons why we are uh, going to other clouds as well. And operating in several regions or cloud providers simultaneously. Exactly. Yes. So there's government instances, there's EMEA, there's other areas that we need the ability to, to move between different infrastructure. Right, right. Uh -huh. So um, the idea of <clears throat> using multiple clouds is very enticing, mm -hmm. but it also comes with a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um, you alluded to the fact that having separate instances means that you lose that data aggregation yeah. point. So. How are you planning to keep that data aggregation when you're spreading it across multiple clouds that have different data lakes? Yeah, yeah, good question. And uh, you know, that's that's basically you know the the problem over here is exactly the same that you would see if I would start giving each customer their own their own cluster. Right. So at a higher level, the answer is yes. It would be difficult to coordinate, but you know, if you if you think about it. You know, you can come up with ways in which you know, given you have two data, given that you're running two data centers, you can basically share contracted in you know contracted data like 
aggregated data across them. But I would, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge, and you do compromise some of the you know uh, the agility that you would have if you run everything in the same place. But you know, then again, we we also want to be you know, fault tolerant and be able to move to you know move people from one cloud to the other cloud well that's uh, that's easier said than done but uh, but you know yeah you're right uh, we do we do lose some agility if we have two data centers running but you know, that's something which as you grow you might you would have to do because you don't want to be uh, dependent on just one cloud vendor right yeah i mean in a multi region environment aws you can at least set up replication of S3 buckets or something similar to go across cloud and you're using their backbone so it's yeah. pretty performant. Yeah. Moving it over into Azure is going to be its own set yes. of challenges. Yes. Um, and I'm curious how you're going to present this up to customers who want to determine which one they're going to land on and how you can guarantee that they're going to only use the Azure instance because they don't want AWS. Yeah. Good observation. So you know, uh, back when we have when we were having these dis these discussions, so my take on it was, if someone doesn't say I have a very pressing reason to be on a certain cloud, we put them on a default cloud. We would want to keep as many people as we can on one cloud. But of course, if if you know companies have policies that they can't for like for example, uh, the government, the federal government. They won't be on just any region. Uh, right. They they want to be on some. So if there is a pressing reason, we'd we'd allow that. But by default, everyone comes to the same uh, to the same region. And to date, we've been we've done a good job of doing that. You know, uh, right now today, we just have uh, we were on Amazon one data center. And of course, like we do the multi multi AZ uh, multi AZ uh, spread. But we are we are in we are as one data center right now. Okay. Single region, correct? <clears throat> single region, single region for, for production right now, yeah. Okay, so uh, starting off with, so uh, these part instances, like you can see in the pictures, they can be dicey. They come at a cheap price, they can, they'll, you, know, you, you can keep on using them, but they're double faced. You, Amazon can take them at any given time. And previously, you know, when I started using them four, uh, five years ago, they won't give a warning. Uh, these days, they're giving a two-minute warning for it, but uh, you know, we don't use it uh, b because the way we have built the infrastructure that I'll, ch uh, I'll share, uh, you know, in the coming slides as well, uh, we don't uh, use that pretty mu uh, that mu that much. But uh, as I mentioned, it comes at a significant discount. Typically, you should expect 80% discount on top of on-demand pricing. But in my experience, I've seen that you know, if you just consider the compute cost. By itself, you can get up to discounts of like 90 percent, which is which is huge. Um, so these parallel applications, they would run over a million cores or more than a million cores, and the me and the mean time between failures for a single socket or, or you know, let's say a single core would be such that these applications should expect a failure every few hours. So what we what we ended up doing over there was that guys, applications are going to fail. We have to accept it. What we have to do is, while you know the hardware people are improving ways of uh, you know increasing the mean time between failures, we have to come up with ways where we accept the failures and we write the software that can resist failures. And that's what you know. That's what my takeaway point is. You have to embrace. If you are in the cloud, the underlying hardware is out of your control. So you have to embrace unreliability, and then make reliable systems. Current, uh, as of today, we are you know uh, across our entire production data center. Eighty percent of our production data center is on spot instances. All of our uh, compute, which is you know basically the Mesos, which is running our API, our real-time processing, as well as Apache Storm, they are hundred percent on spot instances. We do save a lot of money out of it, but the thing I like about it is it forces our software to be reliable, like you know in the sense that. Any developer who's writing software, if he's if his or her code is not reliable, we're going to figure that out very soon because we have we have instances terminating every day, every few hours. And uh, just to give some context over here, this is uh, you know uh, we track because we you know we 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 are taking a. Well, I don't think we are taking a great risk, but generally people think of spot instances as being very risky. 
And uh, for that reason, we do track how many servers get terminated in a, you know, in a given day. And you can see over there in that graph, in, in March, there was, a, there was a span of time where we lost as many as 800 instances. That's significantly more than our entire data center together. And it looks, it looks a little freaky to start with that, what does it mean? The entire data center just went away, but this, you know, th these are aggregated numbers. So what that means is that maybe you know, we lost 20 or 30 servers at nine in the morning, another 20, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes later. So in aggregate, we lost 800 servers, but the best part of it was no one noticed anything. And uh, how do you do that? Uh, you know, that'll, that'll come in the next slide. I'll just get the cost thing out of the way because my CEO, he loves the cost part. Um, I also love it because, you know, it's good for our margins, but, uh, you know, I'm more into the reliability thing. Uh, just to put some perspective, our, our, production, class, our production data center is around, uh, you know, getting closer to 5,000 uh, vCPUs. 80% of it is on spot, as I mentioned, but the, the key takeaway over here is that 19% of our production data center is on non-spot instances, which is primarily uh, reserved instances. And that constitutes more than 50% of our costs. So yeah, there, there, are, there are huge savings for, uh, for using spot instances. But you know, I use spot instances for, the, for this reason. Uh, back, in my previous, uh, back in my previous job, I got to know about Chaos Monkey, uh, as some of you might be familiar with it. And I was, you know, the idea immediately struck me that you should create chaos yourself in your data center to test out how reliable your data center is. But, you know, there'll, there'll be days when things would go wrong and we just stop, to, stop chaos monkey. We'll say, guys, we have enough problems on our hand. We don't want to have additional server terminations and, you know, uh, that part. And that, that bothered me. That bothered me in the sense that this is controlled chaos. How can you stop the chaos? By using Amazon's spot instances, we, we truly enter into a world where there is uncontrolled chaos. Because whether we lose an instance on Amazon or not, we cannot dictate it. I mean, uh, maybe some of the very, very big companies, they can have an impact on it. But with 5,000 vCPUs, we don't have a, any, you know, any effect on it. So basically, it's just like you know, uh, the nature taking over. We'll, we'll lose instances based on what the rest of the world is doing. So uh, how do you use effectively? You know, the first time I used it, we ended up losing an entire cluster because we weren't using it correctly. And uh, you know, there's, there's a, there is a simple way of thinking about how to use spot instances. It's, a, it's just like stock markets. People come and people bid on these extra machine lying at Amazon, and whoever bids the highest, you know, there's a high chance he'll get the, uh, he'll get the machines. So, so basically, it's just like stock market in the sense that when you start get bidding on these machines, don't bid on one stock. Or in, other, in, 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 the, in this context, don't bid on one spot instance type. So what you do is you diversify across spot markets. So basically, don't just say, I want an R3 8x large, you know, which is a 32 core machine with certain RAM. Just don't say, I want just this type of machine. Because what, what is going to happen is, one fine day, someone puts, you know, a bigger company puts in a higher bid and you're going to lose your entire cluster. So diversify across spot markets. And then uh, we put in some research on to how to intelligently select which instances to use. Because, you know, the, the cool thing is that if you go and analyze these instances on, on Amazon spot market, their reliability or, you know, in other words, how soon, how frequently you'll, Amazon will take one back from you, they are very dependent on what instance types you're asking. I, uh, typically, what I've seen is that their compute-bound machines, their C, their, C, uh, their C family is harder to get. It, you know, it's very volatile compared to some of the other, uh, some of the other families. But diversification is, you know, uh, is the key over there. And then you need to be ready for when the machines go away, which means 
you have to over provision. But the question comes, how do you figure out how much to over provision by? Uh, you know, you keep 5% extra capacity, 100% extra capacity, because there'll be a time when your cost benefits will go away. So uh, we, do, we, we, we took a very simple approach over there and uh, we said, okay, if this doesn't work, we'll, go to, we'll refine it and go to something which is more sophisticated. But currently what we do is we monitor how many instances do we lose over a given period of time. And um, what I've typically, typically seen is that Amazon takes less than five minutes to give you a spot instances from the time you ask for one. Which means that I can, if I lose an instances right now, I can get a newer one uh, replaced by a newer one five minutes later if I'm willing to use another instance type. So the lead time is five minutes and uh, the next thing we do is how, what is the maximum number of instances we have seen Amazon take away from us in a given five minute time. And th in this example, let's say this is, uh, that number came out to be nine and then I, you know, you take the nine which is the number of instances that terminated in a period of five minutes, and then you multiply it with a, you know, a magic multiple, a risk factor, whatever you want to call it. You know, this is basically about how much confident are you in, you know, in, in claiming, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so is Mist uh, helping uh, customers that want to consume cloud services to better use spot instances? Is that is that like the end goal of the product or? No, no and you know, okay, uh, that's... yeah, and that's why, you know, uh, I was, when, uh, so what I'm presenting over here, we do not directly sell any of this technology. Okay. So we are, the product is, you know, the AI driven <laughs> Wi-Fi, but this is our engineering trying to make sure that we deliver the end product in a reliable way and also in a cost-effective way. Okay. But yeah, we, we, I don't think we have any plans of uh, setting out this technology. But yeah, there are, there are a bunch of companies like, you know, <coughs> Short Ends and uh, uh, Kubal is another one who are, who are basically selling, you know, similar solutions to, uh, but we're not in that space as of now. Right, I mean, this is, uh, from an engineering perspective, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I think, uh, maybe to, to Chris's point, um, we we don't have a really great idea of what Mist is doing as a as a company and uh -huh. a service yet. Uh -huh. So if we could dive into that a little bit more, um, I mean we understand you're AI driven, mm -hmm. and you're trying to make uh, network performance better mm -hmm. for clients. But I'd like to hear a little bit more about like how that actually happens in a real world example. Uh -huh. um, like what what okay. what's an example of a client that is getting this awesome improved performance from your cool engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you want me to maybe yeah. chat on this? Um, um, so th there's really actually um, two things that we're delivering, and, and apologies, we didn't set the stage well enough. Um, on the one hand, it's making Wi-Fi just more predictable, reliable. On the other hand, it's actually offering location services on top of that. So the Wi-Fi example is, um, uh, there, there's, there's, there's so many, but um, uh, uh, some examples are, for example, Gap. Um, all the stores in, in Gap are moving towards uh, Mist. Uh, there's a couple thousand stores already deployed. And what they are, are doing is, one is setting up service levels um, using the cloud and using things like mutual information and data science so that the minute someone um, shows up, mostly employees, particularly with scanners and stuff, that if a time to connect falls below a service level, if capacity falls below a service level, they're going to immediately get notified. They're going to immediately get recommendations on how to fix that is an example of that. Um, the virtual network assistant that Osmond mentioned is something that all of our customers use, them being one of them, where they can literally come in and type in what was wrong with store 153. And it'll come back and it'll say, um, you had a coverage issue, it impacted one user. It impacted 20 users, here's how you go fix it. So that's an example of how AI is being used in the cloud to do things like event correlation, is it a wireless issue, is it a wired issue, not, to set up service levels, to do anomaly detection, that's an example. Um, another example is we talked about the top um, e-tailer in the world, um, uh, and, and they're using all their warehouses and fulfillment centers. Their challenge is if a robot breaks, he can't call for help, right? And they lose potentially you know, tens of millions of dollars every hour that thing's down, right? If the people in the warehouse, the scanners don't work, they lose, I think, $30 every time they miss a scan because they have to potentially miss an order and reship an order, right? So those are some examples of how proactive operations are helping on the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi side. Um, and again, the, the list 
the list goes on. Um, you know, another great example is we had a customer that was about to push out a new build um, of, their, of their switch. To, uh, and it happened to be retail as well to about 300 stores. And the night before it went out, we got flagged and said, there's something wrong. Our APs are not getting traffic any, anymore. There's something on this wired switch. And they all got in a room. They're like, absolutely not. We're, we're good to go. And one guy sheepishly just said, actually, I just did that 10 minutes ago. And they realized they'd had the wrong date on it. They, they did a build from you know, like a year ago. So that's an example. We're starting to get all this data percolating in, moving to the cloud to help with Wi-Fi. What I didn't really talk about, and, and we didn't focus on this, is the other cool thing about the wireless space now is not just about connectivity anymore. It's actually now about engagement and asset location and better personalized experiences. So the other thing that we're doing in our cloud is location services. And so um, what's unique about our access points is they actually have um, Bluetooth antenna rays in them. So the minute you come on site at the Gap or an IKEA or, or, or um, you know, the, the VA administration in Orlando, it can wake up your app. It can greet you. It can give you turn-by-turn -turn directions on where you want to go. Um, they have wearables on, on elderly patients where if they're walking towards a door and there's not a nurse with them, we'll lock the door. Mm. So now you can see things like location and Wi-Fi are all coming together. But the only way you can do that if it's all moving to the cloud, you have all that data, the ability to process that data and make intelligent decisions. Um, so those are some of the examples there. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost, almost like two companies, but it's the Wi-Fi just going after the traditional Cisco's and Aruba's that are just, they're 10-year-old technology. They're built on on-premises controllers. They don't scale. Um, they're trying to add AI, but they're doing it in appliances. So you mentioned that I issue of you know, having a, to work with potential between two global instances on different clouds. Imagine trying to do that with hardware appliances you know, in China or, or even Meraki, which are you know, 10,000 AP shards and be able to collect that. You know, you know, we're coming at it from a much better architecture to be able to take all that data and do stuff with it. So it's moving Wi-Fi into the next generation, and then what we're doing is bringing in the wire. Right? So now EX switches can be part of this domain. So the same service levels you're doing on wireless, you can do on wired. Um, you can bring in a security profile. So if someone flags and says, we're having an issue, um, we can actually quarantine that wireless user and say, oh, by the way, they're located in that corner. Go check them out. Right? So you can actually see this end-to-end this -end experience is now coming under one domain, leveraging the cloud. Um, just a question on the service levels, which you mentioned a couple of times there. They can be notoriously like, hard to define. Yeah. Um, do you have kind of a, a listening reporting mode and then kind of recommend what service level should be and then perhaps any changes to the infrastructure to, to lower or, 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 yeah. or, or, or so it's a good, those. it's a good question. So it starts to, for, for one, there's not infinite service levels. There's like, you know, 10, right, around the key metrics that impact wired and wireless performance. So time to connect, roaming, AP uptime, throughput are some of the ones that we have. It comes as, as default with recommendations. So, you know, I want everyone to connect in two seconds or less. I want everyone to get at least 30, you know, 10 megabits per second throughput. And then it's really easy, um, again, we can, we can show you, but it's really easy just to click and customize it, whether I want it across all my sites or whether I want it on individual sites. Um, the other thing that's actually very cool about the cloud he designed, it's all 100% open and programmable. So we are an, actually an API first company. In fact, there's actually more to do in our APIs than you can do in our UI. And so when you're doing something like these service levels, the way that works is, for example, one of our customers is ServiceNow, where if it falls below a service level, they'll create a trouble ticket. And other folks can do it with ServiceNow in the back end, right? Where they get notified, says, we fell below 80%. Here's how you go fix it. And oh, by the way, um, you may want to go notify the end user that we know there's a problem. Um, you know, can you imagine if you walked into a building or a hotel and you got a call from the front desk and said, we know you're having a wireless issue. We're going to refund your money. Or uh, you know, we're on it. You know, imagine what that does for customer service. So the automation is, 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 is key to doing that. You know, in fact, um, I know this, the term software defined is a little overused, but Verizon launched their software defined wireless LAN service on MIST because it's all about that. They can completely configure things and automate things to deliver better service, <coughs> um, tying back to that engineering simplicity story. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Okay. And then the other thing we do is obviously we have a whole pool of scripts, you know, Python scripts uh, that we'll share with folks that's, you know, that customers, you know, can kind of lend to other folks to, to kind of do this whole DevOps mentality around just Wi-Fi operations, uh, location type of algorithms as well. So we definitely want to share that with the community and have folks learn from each other to, to use that. So from an AI ML type point of view, are you building all your own models? And yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, uh, uh, and, and 
to answer part of uh, the earlier question and and this question so if i if i understood the question you know to add to what jeff uh, jeff said so uh, you know like for example at my home my time to connect is 2 seconds and is that good is that bad i don't know uh, so that's where anomaly detection comes into play that you know you we are basically saying that we are going to detect anomalies whether you are getting a time to connect of 2 seconds or 5 second that doesn't matter if you have been happy for the last let's say so many days we are going to detect an anomaly if it is anomalous compared to previous historical data then we'd flag that if it's not it's going to be fine so that helps you in in the way that you know uh, you you get you know get, you get free you break free from setting your own levels yeah. And that's where, you know... Uh, yeah, and maybe let me answer your question a little bit as, as well. So um, there's lots of algorithms out there that are, are common algorithms, right? Bayesian inference, mutual information. So we have 10 data scientists, and their goal is to take a lot of those algorithms and apply it specifically to the domain. So domain exp expertise, right? So um, there's a couple things that, that make the AI successful, right? The first is data. You know, uh, our CTO always says uh, a wine is only as good as the grapes. AI is only as good as the data you collect. So from day one, what these guys did is they designed the access points to collect over 150 user states from every mobile client every two seconds and move it to the cloud. Um, and then combining with Juno's telemetry, you know, we have way more ability to collect better data out there as to what your wireless and wired users are than anyone else, number one. Then number two is you got to move it to the cloud and be able to kind of process that using domain-specific experience. And that's where we took things like mutual information to apply it to network-based service levels. Bayesian inference, you know, and other things to detect anomalies, to do predictive analytics, um, to be able to say, all right, you set up an SLE saying, I want everyone in this room to get 10 megas per second throughput. That's interesting. That's, that's a, a state and time. But I want to be able to predict and say, if only half of you are actually on the network and the other half wanted to get on that network, can I hit that SLA? So that's, again, starting to use these algorithms with domain-specific experience. So it goes data, then domain-specific experience, then the next thing we added is the virtual network assistant, which is really cool. Where again, that's like Alexa for IT. So we're literally, I can come in and say, what was wrong with Osmond's iPhone yesterday? What was wrong with the access point in the corner? You know, simple questions. How many users are unhappy today? And it'll come back and it'll say, you have five users that are unhappy. They all happen to be on an iPhone. Oh, by the way, they're all on iOS 10.1.2. You may want to upgrade them. Or, um, you know, this is specific just to Jeff's iPhone. He seems to keep having a, you know, a, 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 a coverage issue, maybe as a bad antenna, right? So that's the virtual network assistant. And then the last area which we're getting more and more towards is completely self-driving. You know, once you get that trust factor, then you want the network to be able to adapt on its own, right? To be able to change channels, which we're doing today, change power, but also completely configure itself um, and, and, and kind of be in a self-driving mode. We're not quite there yet. You know, that requires even more data, but also the trust thing. You know, when we present at Mobility Field Day and Network Field Day, the guys look at us and I'm like, you're not, you know, there's no way I'm going to turn my, my network on autopilot, right, and let you guys run it. And that's where the VNA comes in. The more we prove to them that we're coming out with the right decisions, the same decisions that they would come out with, the more they, they, they take a step back and say, all right, that's, that's pretty cool. And we mentioned the top retailer, the top search engine company. Those guys are like, no freaking way am I turning on RRM, radio resource management, and letting you guys guide it. And now a year later, they're like, yeah. You know, we, we believe you guys. You guys are choosing the right channels. You're choosing the right power outputs. You've proven it to us. Hmm. Yeah. yeah um, does it mean that in MIST you can manage uh, some multi-factor authentication uh, policies? Um, multi-factor authentication policies? So yeah, multi-factor yeah. authentication policies uh, well, what, through MIST? Contest? Yeah, so, so the way we do it, there's, there's a bunch of different ways we do authentication. Um, there could be a guest Wi-Fi network, which is captive portal, which is kind of like here, social media, 802.1x. Um, so yeah, all the standard authentication policies. Uh, I was meaning some multi-factor authentication uh, as uh, in Microsoft uh, architecture. Uh, for example, uh, with your example for the nurse opening automatically the doors, uh, can we imagine that uh, for uh, some special loca location, we need to have uh, two specific people to uh, to open oh, this I door? See what you're saying. So and. It, could it be automatic if the both people are uh, present at, um, the, the, uh, at the right location? The answer is yes, potentially. I mean, what, all we are is the infrastructure that's giving the XY coordinates, right? So as long as uh, you have an application that's saying, I want to pull your XY coordinates and his XY coordinates and in the back end tie it to do uh, uh, intelligence, that's totally fine. We're just, uh, again, we're just the infrastructure that's coming in and saying, Osmond's here, Jeff's here, do what you want with the data. Okay. And so that's how it applies to security. 
That's how it applies to engagement, like um, wayfinding. That's how it applies to advertising. So um, we, you know, we have this cool concept known as a virtual beacon. How many folks here are familiar with location in, in wireless? Anyone in, in BLE? Um, so the way that, that works, and I don't know if he has one or not, is you know, the way it works today is you put a battery beacon on the wall every 25 feet, and you program each beacon. So if I walk into Macy's, it'll say, welcome to Macy's. And if I walk past men's shoes, it'll pop up and say, we're having a sale on men's shoes, right? It's not a very scalable solution. Those beacons can be stolen. They get knocked down. What we've done is since we have these access points with BLE in them, and so if we have machine learning in the cloud for location, we don't need to put those things on the wall anymore. So we have this concept known as virtual beacons. Or uh, using software, we can set up whatever beacons we want with whatever messages we want. So that's another example where we're just giving x, y coordinates and letting the, the, the retailer figure out what message he wants to give. Um, Swan and Dolphin can come out and say, you know, if I'm standing by the buffet, come in for 20% off buffet. Um, Orlando VA can say, free flu shots, come on yeah. in. And does it include also vision AI? Also vision AI? Vision AI, yes, mm. for recognition, not, not, not face yet. recognition. Also. No, face recognition, because we don't have a way, you know, we don't have any video feeds, so that's why no facial recognition. It comes you know, up a lot. Uh, okay. It's something, yeah, we're, we're starting to look at. It's to tie in facial recognition and um, with some of the other stuff. And, I think, um, oh, one other thing about location that I wanted to, you know, uh, quickly share was that it's, it's closer to what you said, and you know, sorry, I'm sharing slides from my previous talk. Uh, it's, you know, we get a lot of, like Jeff mentioned, X, Y coordinates. And one of the things that you know, we've been trying to do is, and this is, you know, this is something uh, which you know, part of it is in the product, part of it is uh, you know, we're planning to get it to uh, production. But what we are interested in doing is, how do the patterns change? Like for large shopping malls, how many people are in one area? How do people move from one area to another? And you know, we, we just decompose the whole map into a 2D grid. And then you know, uh, because we are getting these x, y coordinates every second or so, we are interested in counting how many unique devices we see in each yeah. of these zones. It, it's, or, it's really critical for analytics is where he's getting at. Because it's, it's, using wireless just for analytics can be a little complicated. Like think of a mall. Right, if, I, if I leave the mall and come back into the mall in the same entrance, is that the same person? Is it one person? Is it, you know? And especially if you're, not, um, if you're not opted in. There's two types of analytics, right? There's passive and there's active. Active means I'm opted in, right? I'm giving you my information in exchange. You're giving me something like advertisements or, 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 or coupons. Um, but a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, and so there's passive analytics, which I just know there's 10 iPhones in this room. I don't know who you are. Right? And so the challenge is if, I'm, if iPhones are going to anonymize a MAC address um, and I'm going to walk in and out of a mall or in and out of a trade show or in and out of a convention center, it's really hard to track that, is, is where Osmond was getting at that. So there's a certain amount we can give, but then just tie that in with other third parties or facial recognition. That's where some of these folks are trying to get a little bit more advanced. Yeah, analytics. but that's suppose that people enable uh, their Bluetooth in their phone. And as Bluetooth is a leak, is a security leak in the phone, Personally, it isn't yeah. enabled, so uh, that could be um, um, uh, it, it could be not available for all people. Or yeah, it's not it's not a be all end all solution. But for our environments that we're going into, for a lot of the retail uh, to engage with customers, asset location, because um, one of the key things is um, Bluetooth is the standard that the phones have revolved around for location. Yeah, but it's easy to hack Bluetooth. It's e easy to hack. The other thing is, you probably know this, um, maybe for everyone else, let me show you. Um, if you put your iPhone down like this, the Bluetooth works. If you put it down like that, the Bluetooth turns off. <laughs> yeah, but this is Apple. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's definitely ways to... to <laughs> that's why I don't have it. Yeah, yeah, so that's an Android. So, did that answer the question in terms of use cases? Um, yeah, yeah. I apologize was I didn't start with that. That, no, that was probably no. a, a good thing. And the engineering thank stuff you. is pretty cool, too. <laughs> yeah, we, we thought you want to talk to, to Osman, not the marketing guy. And, and, um, so, a um, couple of things. One, I, I like a lot of that, but um, that brings some privacy concerns and ethical concerns around what you're doing with data and tracking. Yeah, so let me, let me talk to that a little bit. Um, yeah, so okay. for one, the only data we move to the cloud and collect is all metadata. We do not collect personal information at all. There is no actual payload information. It's all metadata strictly for troubleshooting, number one. And then the location, as we said, is strictly, uh, uh, if it's not opted in, it's all passive analytics. And so that's how we, we basically kind of um, haven't run into issues with that. Um, in terms of actually what, you know, how we store it in the cloud, how we encrypt it, 
you know, Osmond can talk to that, but again, look at some of our customer lists. We've gone through some pretty heavy security audits to make sure that the data we're doing um, is, is, is fine. Uh, yeah, okay, but like, I can understand that from your point, but the customers that you buy from you are probably gonna end up doing very backhanded tricks of you know, unintended opt-in and, and other things like that. So yeah. still a, a, something to be considered. It, it is certainly, it, you, you're right. And again, it's really not much different than you're already giving that information to Verizon, AT&T with your 5G and LTE, so I'm not sure that's, that's any different for indoor. But you're absolutely yeah, right. That doesn't yeah. negate the. No, it's true. But, you know, it's still. And I think uh, just to just to address that, uh, most of the location, you know, high frequency data that we get, uh, it's a, it's a, it's through an SDK. So uh, to start with, it's definitely not coming from someone who is not aware of it. So people are aware of it. Mm -hmm. And the 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 second thing we do on the, on the cloud side is, you know. Right when we get the uh, get the data before it gets pushed to the databases, all that, it's you know the the MAC addresses or any unique identifier, it's transformed. So in other words, you basically you know even if our databases gets comp they get compromised, which we've been doing a good uh, a good job of not getting uh, that, them compromised, even if they they get it's impossible to you know uh, recover the MAC addresses or anything that identifies you uh, to the to who you are. Uh, I wouldn't use the word impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, and, yeah that's, and we're not negating, yeah, we're, not, we're not negating your concern. No, no, that's, no, it's fine. And so the other one as well, um, so you talk earlier on about like multi-cloud or you know different providers. How are you validating that your models are giving you the same results across all of them? Uh, is this in context of? Uh, the machine learning, machine, AI type stuff. Machine so, learning. Uh, yeah. yeah, great question. And you know, right now we have We've been so I'll, I'll I'll cover this question in the first perspective that you know I've seen from a lot of customers is that your your uh, AI says that there is there is an anomaly, but there is no anomaly. I mean I'm I'm fine with it. So that part is you know it's difficult to there are there are two there are two concerns over there. One sometimes you know people care more about their Wi-Fi sometimes they care less so for for those parts the, what we recommend is that you know we we can give you confidence intervals if you want if you don't want to be bothered by you know uh, very frequent alerts you can you know you can uh, but tell us about is the that what you're, you're asking though how do you no, I think what you're I'm asking is between if you're GCP gonna, and you're going to run AWS. yeah GCP AWS yeah. as your um, how are you ensuring yeah. that you're getting the same answer across them all? So, so for starters, right now, right now we're on one. Yeah, right now we're on Amazon. We're not right on Amazon. Right now we're so on Amazon. We haven't, we haven't done the. Um, yeah, right now we're on Amazon. But you know, if I were to give futuristic, uh, you know, uh, predictions, <laughs> I would say that if, uh, from my understanding, if we move from Amazon to Google, I don't expect many things to change because. We aren't using, you know, any machine learning or AI service from Amazon. Or for that matter, you know, we are not planning to use any AI service from Google. So we're going to be just taking off our code, putting it on a different server, and, yeah, and rolling yeah. your own. Yeah, and I may, may answer that also a little bit differently. Um, and I know we have to run to the other stuff, and, and we apologize for running a little late. Um, so one thing we do with Marvis or, or VNA is there's always a closed loop. So anytime any problem comes in, it actually our help desk runs it through Marvis mm -hmm. and they determine did Marvis answer the, the question correctly? If he didn't answer the question correctly, was the answer already in the hardware or the cloud and we just he just didn't know it yet, or were we missing that? And the whole point is there to improve the eff efficacy of that. And uh, uh, again, the reason I bring that up is because it's really the AI engine, not the cloud, yeah. that drives the intelligence. So as long as we're doing that closed loop and Marvis keeps getting better in the answers, I don't think it matters if it's running on GCP or Azure or whatever. It's it's the AI. It's the learning the data lake, and that's where we're, we're, we're leagues ahead of everybody. I think Jeff just reminded me that I think the the AI team and the QA team they they discuss this they plot yeah, the efficacy metric efficacy. and they they very closely follow it. Yeah. yeah so we do that. Um,